All right, welcome back. It's still the breakfast on PLOS TV Africa, and we will be focusing on politics specifically as regards uh, the election matters. With the PDP opposing the nomination of President Mohamed Buhari's aide, Loretta Onoche, as one of the commissioner nominees for the Independent National Electoral Commission, they have even threatened legal action. Yes, they, they have, you know, done more than threaten legal action. They mm. have called on all Nigerians to embrace every legitimate means, including civic action, to protest against what's happening in the Senate right now. So we know that um, Loretta Onoche is a cad car member of the All Progressives Congress. Congress. You know, we know where her party loyalty lies. Mm. We know that... Um, she has, her name was forwarded uh, to the Senate for confirmation as Anik, um, Anik Commissioner about eight months ago that was rejected. So last year, about October, um, Buhari forwarded her name again mm. for confirmation. And the Senate kept it in a bit. And screen, exactly. So mm. now it's coming up once more. You know, lots of reactions to this, especially within the opposition People's Democratic Party. They're basically saying that the fact that she is an APC member hasn't changed. So what's the essence of bringing this up when this was rejected about eight months ago? Looking at this whole um, issue uh, morally, I'm trying to understand how you know, it would play out because it is really something you know, mind-boggling to think that um, as, a P as a member of the All Progressives Congress and over time you have spoken uh, so loudly, you know, passionately, dispassionately as well, uh, concerning the President Mohammed Buhari and of course the All Progressives Congress. Even if you take, like uh, our analyst said uh, during the paper review, even if you have sown uh, some sort of oath and uh, not to be impartial, the fact is that uh, you have your antecedent. Yes. You know, how are we sure that you are going to be nonpartisan? How are we sure that you are supposed to be impartial? How are we also sure that you are going to be independent of all that concerns election matters and, of course, the All Progressives Congress? Exactly. That's the challenge because there are no guarantees mm. as to the impartiality of, you know, what Loretta Onoche, you know, might represent if she becomes any commissioner. So that's why lots of Nigerians And then are, if she, another thing, looking, looking at it, Aneta, if she eventually uh, is screened, you know, and is a member of the, uh, a commissioner of the Independent National Electoral Commission, does that also mean that she would, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, st uh, stop being a member of the APC, would she actually leave that particular party just because she's now uh, a member or a commissioner of the Independent National Electoral Commission? As in, how does it really work? Yes, really, how does it work? These are, these are questions we really need to ask. Mm. Would, would this be a condition for her to be screened and confirmed as INEC chairman, for mm. her to actually um, defect to another party, or for her to actually just... She's really even for her part to, of exact, any political exactly, party. Exactly, for her to totally just you know, pull out of you know, yes. all these political affiliations. Would this be one of the preconditions for her, you know, confirmation. I'm sure there should be um, some conditions before anyone is actually, you know, appointed to be part of the Independent National Electoral Commission. Exactly, and that's why the PDP is just against this. They're saying, um, let, let me read a quote from yeah, um, um, Olog Bodinho here, PDP mm. spokesman. He's basically saying that... Um, their intent and their purpose is to preserve the sanctity and credibility of INEC and, and that um, the APC would, I beg your pardon, the PDP would mm. never allow Senator Lawan and his APC to smuggle. This is a little bit speaking he here. Smuggled. Yes. He said that the PDP would never allow Senator Lawan and his APC to smuggle a fox into INEC <laughs> ship pen <laughs> in their bid to, to corrupt and further desecrate the commission. Mm. And they say that they would never allow the APC to derail their national efforts towards free, fair, and credible processes in their country. Mm. They went on to say that President Muhammad Buhari is basically trying to perpetuate misrule, um, you know, his misrule beyond 2023. Mm. So this is an allegation that the, All Pro the People's Democratic Party mm. is making that the reason, the only motive why President Muhammad Buhari is insisting on Loretta Onoche as INEC chairman or mm. INEC commissioner is so that he can rule beyond 2023. I really don't see how that will work because our constitution does not provide mm. for, you know, presidential, um, you know, race or candidature beyond two terms. Of course. You know, so we really don't know how that will work. Mm. But he went on to accuse 
accused Lawan of, you know, trying to be like a puppet to the APC, mm. accusing him of not being independent, of, of being biased, you know, trying to say that what he's doing is an impeachable offense, that mm -hmm. it basically is a gross violation of Nigeria's constitution, and just basically saying everything that is wrong with, you know, the, the, the act of putting forward Loretta Onoche's name yeah. as an INEC commissioner. Okay, he went on to say that our party reminds him, Senator Lawan, that the reason that forced his hands to stand down on a chase forwarded nomination eight months ago have neither changed nor abated. Mm -hmm. The reasons are still sticking and they are not far-fetched. Uh, quote, he says, in case Lawan needs to be reminded, paragraph 14 of the third shadow of the 1999 constitution as amended forbids a person involved in partisan politics to hold office as a member of Vinet. The constitution clearly stipulates what is required for anyone to be part of the Independent National Electoral Commission. Indeed. indeed. Th these are the real issues that we have to begin to debate mm. to find out exactly why does the president, you know, want Loretta Onoche approved and confirmed as INE commissioner. Okay. Um, we know we now have a public affairs analyst, Ezekiel Iaito. Good morning, Mr. Iaito. Thanks for joining us here today. Good morning. Again. Good morning. Thanks for having me again. Yes. All right. We've been looking at, we've just been discussing the issue that we mentioned earlier you know, when we were looking at off the press, the issue of um, the nomination of um, Loretta Onoche as uh, a commissioner of the Independent National Electoral Commission. We've tried to analyze uh, the moral justification and, of course, constitutionally, because uh, uh, the PDP clearly st stated what the... Um, Constitution says, uh, in case Lawan needs to be reminded, paragraph 14 of the third schedule of the 1999 Constitution as amended forbids a person involved in partisan politics to hold office as a member of INEC. And I'm sure the Senate President, as the custodian or a lawmaker, clearly not, uh, knows what the Constitution of Nigeria says. You know, we, we started this discussion in the morning and yes, it's a little deeper than this. What concerns me is what really motivates people to take public office. We really need to uh, uh, look into that very, 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 very seriously. Mr. President is not just a president. There are one, two, three things that stand out about him. Number one is that he was a former head of state. So he understands what it means. He should understand what it means to be the leader of a country. Though he was so at a military time, but even at a military time, leadership is global. Whether you are in the army, leadership is leadership. Whether you are head of a corporate body, leadership is leadership. Whether in, you are in a democratic setting, you should understand that leadership is about organizing the system to the best interest of the constituents of that system. Okay? So he had that, he's not naive, he's not, he's not, he's not new to the block. He's been a head of state before. Second is that he's wanted to be a president on four occasions. The first three didn't work out, the last one worked out. Okay? So if you've done something three times, I've contested twice to be a governor. As at today, I should be able to tell people what it is, what it means for you to want to be a governor. It means you have the resources of the people. It means you have the life of the people. It means you have the hopes of the people for you to manage so that at the end, of your trainer, the people are better off. It's about the people. It's not about me wanting to be. If it's about personal, whatever, go build your company. Go and be the CEO of your company, and then you can do as you wish. But when you are the head of an institution, you are not the owner of that institution. You know? And again, in government, before we talk in terms of the processes and the evolutions, there were times that you had you know, warlords who were kings and they conquered territories. It was about them. It was their domain. They superintended over those territories. They were the lords. They were the kings. But this is a democracy where the leader of that democracy is the chief servant. And the underlying word is servant. Why am I saying all these things? For Mr. President to make certain, what I may call, I choose to call, 
mistakes for my own sanity. I, I think I find it difficult to understand. Come down to the issue in question. Please, does Mr. President not understand that INEC is expected to be a fair, unbiased, after running three times, failing, calling Jega names, and all sorts of things, being very unhappy that he was badly treated, assuming that he was maltreated, that the system was unfair to him, seeking justice, going as far as to the Supreme Court, he should understand what it means like to be on the other side of the divide and what's fair is fair. He's a man of integrity. He should understand the concept of fairness. Why would you, of all people, want to have your media aid as an umpire in INEC? Exactly, Mr. Yai that, that That really is my question, Mr. Yai what do you yeah. think Buhari might be thinking, President Muhammad Buhari might be thinking, that motivated him to send Loretta Onocho's name, who's a CAD carry member of the APC, as an INEC commissioner? When the party, when, when INEC in itself, you know, has the word independence as it should be? Two things. The first one might not be very nice. And that's that, to what extent is Mr. President aware? You say, oh, he signed a letter. I'm happy to hear. But let me tell you something, and I should say this advice certainly. I think that there are many letters, I think that there are many letters coming from the president's presidency that Mr. President, we need to draw a line between Mr. President and presidency, and nothing makes this more, um, more subtle than a question asked by the Secretary to Government of the Federation, former, a man who occupied the office that is like the engine room of the presidency. And Baba, uh, uh, Law, uh, Lawal, uh, Baba Chi Lawal, when they asked me a question, he asked me, he retorted, who is presidency? That question is instructive. And Nigerians should not just laugh over it like we do. Who is presidency? Mm. We need to understand what presidency is and what president. So my question is, how many of the documents that come out of presidency really have the scrutiny of Mr. President? That he signs a letter. There are two types of signatures. One could be electronic signature, and that electronic signature could come one way or the other. One is that I authorize you to, okay, go ahead and take a decision for me on my behalf. I don't know how it's done. The second is that Mr. President has a way of trusting people. One of my friends told me, a very, very big person in government, he said, once I'm rushing to the car and they bring documents for me to sign, I never sign those documents. Because the people that work with you understand when to give you something that you don't need to read through. They make it like an urgency, and then it's okay, okay, have you read through it? Yes, I've got, are you sure it's okay? Yes, sir, it's okay. Pa, 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 you sign, I take. They, they read you, they study you like a book. They know what document to bring to you at what time. I've been friends with a lot of people that are either working directly with the governors or even in the presidency. And I go to discuss a matter and they say, bro, sleep, I'm not now. Don't worry, when the right time comes, we'll let you know. What they mean is that there's a time for every game. So the question is, have these people studied Mr. President like a book and know the time to submit certain things that he will not interrogate? Secondly, have they primed his mind in a certain way, you know, before time, so that when they take a document to him, say, sir, that thing we did, and blah, 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 these are the names, and they know there's a way you could put a name in a list that nobody notices. Mr. Yechok, Mr. Yechok, are you yeah. inferring that the decision to submit Loretta Onoche's name as INE commissioner was not solely the president's? There's a possibility that the president is not in the full picture of that. Because I know that, you see, no matter how much I'm not too much a fan of Mr. President, I know that there are certain things he holds on to you know, as principles, I know that for a fact, okay? And you'll be shocked that if you asked him in one of those interviews, 
Mr. President, why would you want your age to be, uh, you know, an INEC commissioner? I know you're all sensitive. He might ask you, who? You'll be shocked. That's probably one of the reasons because Mr. President, you know, he, he has this childlike, you know, approach to things and he just says what's in his mind. Look at the interview between one of your sister stations and that of the NTA. You can tell two different people. A man that talks off the cuff from his heart and a man that no good. So, Mr. Yeto, Mr. Yeto, you're basically suggesting that the president really is not in charge of some of these decisions oh, that me. seem to be by the president. So, if if that's the case, who then is who's the presidency and who's in charge? And again, as a follow-up follow to that question, a follow-up to that yes. question, even if um, the yes. president is not so aware of who he nominated or appointed. Yes. Speaking yes. about principle and morality, shouldn't uh, the yes. aide herself know that she, since she is a card-carrying member of the All Progressives Congress, doesn't morality tell her that she should not be part of an independent commission? It just shows that her personal interest supersedes the reputation of her blood. And it's sad. It shows that her personal interest, it shows that loyalty within this context more the question. Because there are certain things that you want to do. Even there are certain things your boss wants to do for you. And you say, ah, I'll go leave it to this office. The way people they talk, I appreciate it. Let it be the other way. That's because in spite of the fact that it will benefit you, you are thinking this is a social media lady. She's active in the social media. She knows what's going on. To what extent is the reputation of, of her boss important to her? More important than her personal, you know, gains and aggrandizement and all of that. So I think that I, I don't want to talk about the lady. Uh, and uh, I actually feel between you and I, the Bible says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. She should know better. So and back to my question, Mr. Yaitok, who then is controlling the presidency? <laughs> I want a question. I think I should ask the journalist who is, who am I, bloody architect, all I know is housing. So, journalist, please, who is behind the president? <laughs> That's one question that we are, you know, uh, you know, all looking forward to getting answers to. Let's stay with election matters. Uh, you know, also yeah. yesterday, the Independent National Electoral Commission uh, announced uh, you know, new polling units that they have created specifically about uh, over 50,000 of them. And of course, some new policies were made. Uh, you know, uh, voting cannot be done at mosques and churches and some other areas. But with this new development, with the creation of more polling units, do you see uh, the desired changes uh, we hope to see in our election, uh, uh, maybe in 2023? I have continued to um, be a fan of INEC because um, INEC needs to know that they have people there who are supporting them so that they can take independent decisions. If the system, when I say system, it's like the presidency, the party in power, wants them to pander to their own whims and caprices, they need to know that there are elder statesmen out there who are behind them so that they do the right thing. We can't all be knocking INEC. If not so, taking line of least resistance is a natural human self-preservation mode. Okay? So to that extent, I think that in election management, the turnaround time is very important for you or to you as, as an umpire. As a result, you want to strive to see that you don't have more than 500 people within a polling unit because you are asking yourself if I open the voting by 12 o'clock or by 8 o'clock in the morning, how many people taking the turnaround per person can I have by maybe 2 o'clock? And when the number comes between maybe 40 and 60, depending on 400 and 600, depending on the people, and you take the average line of 500, and you discover that certain polling units have as many as 1,000. 300 people, it's just wise for you to seek a situation where you can have less people per polling unit. This is basically the underlying factor behind the action that INEC has created. And I think that that INEC, that decision is informed. 
and it is well motivated. The only thing is that they found they themselves doing this. If we had a situation where there was a combination of, you know, online voting and then on-site voting, you know, then they would now know that even a polling unit that has as many of, um, say, 1,500, about 1,000 of such people may decide to stay in the comfort of their homes and do their online voting. So that will not be a problem. But for a situation in the current dispensation we are in, I think that I need, you know, with all due respect, I'm taking a decision that is patriotic, that is informed, that is difficult, you know, but I think it's the best thing they could do. And within this context, I, I, I applaud INEC's um, efforts. All right. Um, INEC also made some changes and um, some polling units have been moved from where they were uh, before to other places, specifically from mosques, from churches um, to shrine. In your opinion, do you foresee any sort of a maybe uh, miscommunication uh, during uh, uh, election um, period uh, in uh, maybe next year when they even have uh, those of them um, or showing, of course, um, in Ikiti State. Good. That is where people come in with respect to feedback. Luckily for me, this decision has not been taken two weeks to election. No. It has been taken about um, over a year to election. It is therefore the duty of parties. And it really bothers me that we, those are wrong parties, you know, there's a story I would not want to go into. When I was the national chairman of Young Democratic Party, and I went for IPAC, the first day was an election, and I applied for the office of the vice chairmanship of that um, um, noble body. And when I was given five minutes to talk, I told them, party is government, either in waiting or in action. Today, PDP is party in, in as at that time, in action. Any of us can be the party that comes up. So you are party in waiting. And if APC had listened to me then, they would have prepared themselves knowing that they were party. Why am I bringing this up? It is the duty, responsibility, obligation of every party chairman at the state level to find out this polling unit, have regular meetings, enlighten their people so that they are not disenfranchised on the day of election. This is very important. But we cannot leave it to INEC for INEC to come and let everybody know. Yes, INEC has a role to play. For instance, if they have an electronic register, and this electronic register shows where the polling unit of each person was, I think they will have two options. Option number one is to ask people as clearly as possible. These are the two uh, units, which one is closer to you? And then from the responses, if they have a spreadsheet at the back end, which is where technology comes in, the analysis can be done easily. And then they can now see that from what they have done, they have been able to change this. And then there's still an overflow of these. They can direct the people. And then within a month or two, they can send direct messages to as many people that have phone numbers. There are some areas that people will not have, but you do the best you can by letting the people know. And secondly, going to publish this list early enough so that people can go and look almost a year to election and not on the election day people are running helter skelter trying to do so that that communication, INEC has a role to play, parties have a role to play, but the first thing should be INEC calling the parties and having a meeting and let them understand role play so that each person can do themselves well and communicate with their electorate. Okay, so now polling units have been added to the ones that we had. So what do you think INEC should begin to, to do to ensure adequate security in these new polling units ahead of the election? Nothing. They can only appeal to the police. You see, like I said, I was, I was um, the chairman of a party at the National, and I had a lot of interface with INEC and the INEC chairman. And he vented his frustrations because he has no control over how can I prosecute people that I have no systems, structures, and infrastructure to, to handle. Secondly, on violence protection, that is a constitutional role of, of, of the police and other military or paramilitary agencies 
to come in as may be coordinated by the police. So to that extent, the best that INEC could do is to have a very strong interface by letting the police know this number of units and then letting the police know the manpower required per unit, letting the police also know the risk analysis of polling units. They are sending polling units in certain areas that you don't really need to put too many people there because I don't need to name them, but they are sending high risk per polling unit. So this question of uh, one policeman, one this, one that per polling unit doesn't work. We need to come down to the realities. And I believe that when that unit of INEC interfaces with the military or with the, with the police, I use the police now to talk in terms of all the apparatus the sections that could give us protection. I think they should start early enough to that, have that interface so the police will be able to let the National Assembly know that for this period, we may need to um, bring in a few more of our retirees to bring them back. You know, in, in every system, there are always a segment that can be called up for national duty if the need so arises for that specific timeline. So these are the ways we need to start to think in government and governance so that these retirees who are still strong, I mean, yesterday it was on the telly of one man that was a retired general at 57, which means he's, he's just my age mate. Well, he might be a little younger because November 1, I'm 58. And you can't imagine that I am retired at this time when my energy is still real top-notch. So what am I saying? Such people can be on the reserve list and for a national assignment like this, they could be called up. But that will only work if that system is negotiated early enough so that the budgetary provision is made, a special budgetary provision. So I think that it is possible if we start planning early enough. The, whole, the bottom line, the password now is early strategic planning. All right, uh, uh, Mr. Um, let's just uh, finalize, but uh, just confirming how possible this is. Uh, what uh, the INEC chairman said yesterday, that uh, this will enable, let me just quote him, fresh registrant and those seeking transfer will know the new polling unit, and it also enabled them to choose their preferred voting uh, locations on election day. Do you see this uh, being possible, that the can, uh, voters can actually choose where exactly they want to vote on elections, uh, election days, rather? It is so possible. Mm. All I need is to have one day interface with the IT unit of INEC. You know, the, what, 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 what the internet can do is, is, is amazing, it's unbelievable. I can sit here today and transfer money to somebody in India or Thailand. I can do almost anything. Imagine the base, the database that contains billions of people. And yet we have just about 100 million voters. Now two things are possible. One is those that have the that, that are online and those that are not. Let's start from what is possible. How many of our voters will like to? I mean, I mean just says if you are a voter, you have your PVC and you like to vote online or register online or no, they say please go online and fill this form, okay? And on a secure site. Within one week, they will have a database that will take nothing less than 40 million voters. I can tell you this for a fact. So they can deal with that and see how they can segment that. Now the next step is those that are not, because we always say, how about those that are not, those in rural areas. My guy, my village is rural area, and I know the number of people with phones and internet, and I communicate with them. So don't tell me that every rural area is so rural that they don't even have access to phone or things like that. A phone, in my village, I can get two units where people can go there and provide that service because I want my people to vote and not to be disenfranchised. All of us seeking election, we are going to be INEX foot soldiers who are going to send out those information and the people will give a feedback and INEX will be sitting down in the office spending not a dime, not a common, and yet being able to get maybe 60% of the problem solved. The other 40% or even 40% of the problem solved, 
The other 60%, they can now bring their ingenuity, creativity, okay, who do we need to work with within a private subsector, who are the heads, who are the people, the village. Look, there is a body called the National Association of um, Village Youth Leaders. In a quiet bomb state, every village has a youth leader. Imagine INEC having an interface with these youth leaders of all the villages. They become very easy points of communication. And it costs you probably next to nothing. You know, we should come to it. You know, in Nigeria, unless we put money to a thing, we don't think it will work because we don't think in terms of service, we think in terms of contract. And it's sad. There are many things you can achieve without lifting a finger because of technology. Let INEC leverage on technology and life will be made much easier for them. And I want to plead with National Assembly and the amendment of the Electoral Act. Let them give INEC leverage to do a lot on technology. Nigeria has moved on. Look at when Mr. Sanusi, let me just put this last thing. Amy Sanusi, you know, said we should go cashless. Everybody said, no, 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 we are not up to that. No, we cannot do that. Blah, blah, blah. He just carried cotton wool, plugged on his ears, took the decision. Now everybody has a, 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 a card that they work with. It's working. We are not as archaic and anachronistic as people think. We are moving with the time. Nigerians are intelligent, even in the villages. It's not a 100%, but even if it's 40%, start with that 40%. Then you know that you have only 60% to contend with. But when you sit down and think everything has to be contract, everything has to be physical, everything has to be manual, everything must be because it is easier for you to manipulate that way. I think we should get off that way. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Ezekiel, here I talk. We thank you. You really have mentioned important points about adopting technology into electoral processes to make that, you know, more convenient and safer. Um, thank you very much for, for coming in. My pleasure. Thank I do you. appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. All right, it's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Yes, and we'll be right back to discuss more important issues in the country. Do stay with us.